Hello everyone and welcome back to the very wholesome playthrough in which we're playing as Comey, currently under Mr. or President V, but we have a couple focuses to get through, and really some events, and then we'll talk about things. So the plan of attack. The Democratic Coalition's leaders have arranged a very important meeting, or at least what was supposed to be a very important meeting. The reason for this meeting was the unstable situation in the Republic. Extremists, radicals, and political violence ran rampant. While the death toll was relatively low from all this infighting, the Democratic Coalition feared things may escalate, leading to coups and the possible collapse of the Republic. Unfortunately, it appears nobody can decide upon a plan of attack in regards to these fears. A number of representatives believe that the coalition should focus on the left and their dangerous revolutionary rhetoric. Others disagree, citing the increasing violence from the right as a largest concern. A third camp within the coalition believes that all of this is unnecessary, and that we should simply focus on campaigning and winning the next election. The debate eventually completely derailed into ad hominems and shouting matches, and it was clear to the leaders of the coalition that no progress was being made. By the end of the meeting, everyone was equally unhappy as was decided that the coalition will simply agree to disagree. The meeting was adjourned and ad hominems ceased and the politicians reluctantly returned to their homes. Now, we got it left as most immediate threat. The center must hold no matter what. The right is too concerning to allow it to exist. So, what we need to do is do eyes to the left so we can suppress them. So, the left is the most dangerous or most immediate threat. In which we can do that one immediately. And the 1962 budget of the Komi Republic. The Komi Republic, unlike many of the warlord states that have spread across the old Soviet Union, is blessed with a formal governmental and economic system. However, this does not entail stability or any sort of expedience in the National Assembly's budgetary machinations. The so-called Vaznesensi, the ruling party in the governing coalition of the Republic, has prepared a budget for the year, a comprehensive initiative focused on external defense, internal policing, and public welfare to repair the damages caused by the bombings, however. Internal polling reveals a rather concern or concerning trend within the coalition. With the current number of confirmed votes, it seems that if any more dissensions at all are to take place within the governing coalition, the budget will fail and the Republic's government will be paralyzed for months. In the wake of the discovery of this distressing trend within the party, the President of the Republic has been forced to make a decision. The budget could be handed to Alexei Kosygin, leader of the Young Reformists Party and talented economist, or could be kept as is in strings pulled to ensure that the vote goes their way. While Kosygin is slightly to the right of the President, his influence could ensure that the budget passes safely and comfortably, evading an embarrassing government failure or shutdown. No alterations will be necessary. Kosygin can handle this. We're going to go with Kosygin because it sounds like because he's just slightly more right-wing than the current president, maybe we'll give him some more influence. So, I asked you guys yesterday whether we should do these focuses or not. And overall, from the replies and the comments, you, instead of focusing just going down, getting to the interlude as fast as possible, you guys recommended that maybe we should do them. So let's do the Infrastructure Repair Act. While the Republic has a Department of Transportation that handles repairs to infrastructure and replacements to damage warcraft, watercraft, and transport vehicles, the Department has constantly delivered complaints about how its funding is insufficient to deal with every issue that it currently faces. A new bill has been proposed to the National Assembly to pass through a special appropriation for the Department of Transportation, which is to be dedicated specifically to providing aid to the Infrastructure Repair Division. However, certain aspects of the bill are undecided, specifically labor laws and the exact source for the funds which are to be dedicated. These matters must be decided on in the National Assembly before the bill is to pass. Great. And yesterday we saw the friend of the left and a passing the compromise. Oh, look at that. The government's national budget proposal passed through the National Assembly today, but many members of the cabinet are disappointed and see it as a defeat. To get the required majority, President Vosneski had to roll back a number of proposed budget changes, especially in regards to cuts to internal spending to balance out the increase in military spending. This has forced the government to consider raising taxes, an unpopular move indeed. At least the president can be relieved the republic will remain functional another year. Here at the Coming Courier, we have to say that this is often all one can hope for. It had to be done to keep the system stable. Cool for now. So we're going to wait till we get more uh, political power so we can get some poverty improvements. Over here, we got to continue suppressing the left, even though we're doing pretty well with it so far. We don't need to see that one yet. We want to raid people as much as we possibly can so we can get good stuff, especially against Vyatka. And with some more low development, which I want to get more stability. And we can purchase some equipment, which I don't really care about. We have two research left. And the rumors of a rising star. Comey's great game of politics has always ran on a steady diet of rumors. Knowing what one's opponents are doing is crucial if one desires to remain in the game, of course. Filtering out signal from noise is a skill all by itself. Tail tall tales, baseless speculation, and hearsay are common fodder for the various intelligence agencies, and it takes time to sift through everything. The latest craze is a rumor that an influential politician from Gorky has traveled the ways to reach Comey. Depicted as a natural politician or political genius and charismatic orator by the rumor mill, Few agree as to what this arrival means. The most popular conclusion is that Suslov, the far left mastermind, is likely behind it. Another communist power player. Oh boy. Oh boy. 
Yeah, we definitely need more divisions where we're headed. Oh my goodness, the rise of Po Ponomarov. As it turned out, the man from Gorky was not from Gorky after all. Boris P, as a man's tr name turned out to be, was born in Shakhovskoy, the small village in what was known as Ulanovsk Oblast, nowadays the Khanar controlled Samar government. Has another famous child in the form of Mikhail Soslav. An interesting coincidence, perhaps? Few in Komishiki democracy would believe this. Whatever his origins are, this charismatic P dude has been making the rounds. His speech lambasting the democratic coalition's unwillingness to deal with the far right have been populated through large swaths of the population. This newcomer rides on a wave of discontent and is likely to be one of the prime communist candidates in the next elections. Now, what do you hide? So what's the question ask? What do you hide now? Purchase infantry equipment. We could try that once. The Veil. A charismatic new communist candidate from Suslav's old stuff and grounds is too much for of a confidence for the democratic coalition's higher ups to swallow. Suslav's commands of Komi's far left is ambiguous and hard to measure. Perhaps a slippery shadow might have made a pact with a charismatic frontman to enhance his control of the party. The young republic's policeman would, of course, never stoop so low as to run private investigations on the enemies of the current government. But monitoring the coming and going of new political figures definitely falls somewhere in their priority list. Better now, better then, to run some background checks on this new figure. We must pierce it. There is no point. Let's see what happens. Political campaign, that's not the one we want. And that's okay. I just want to raid. That's all I want to do. I just want me in raiding an ultimatum. We received an ultimatum from Plus Deck, and they're demanding that we hand over tribute of loot, or else they will raid us and take it from us. Anyway, we are in an impasse to decide. Do we manage to, or do we decide to engage in confrontation with the P Nation? Possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies, or do we instead stand down and cave in to their demands, giving them the desired loot? Allowing our men to fight for another day? Ooh, where's the P Nation? Oh, it's right north of us. I have a good feeling if we're defending over a river, we got enough time to get organization and, entren and entrenchment. We'll be fine. Give it like two weeks. Get them, get those guys up there. Ooh. Oh wait, are they in a faction together? Oh, let's modify this. There you go. Well, actually. Uh, there you go. That's good enough. Ah. Uh, oh, oh, hello. Where'd we go? A revelation. Oh, we went down to South America. Unity pack. No, they're. Ah. No. Huh. Oh. Oh, the other one is a puppet. Okay. Tukhavchevsky. Cool. A revelation. The detectives were dismayed to find that in the end, Ponomayarov was terribly dull. A paper pu pusher in Suslov's foreign ministry during the Rus West Russian War, Mr. P fell off the face of the earth during the ensuing collapse in anarchy. Not too surprising as the front's disintegration had seen tons of people claim authority in these few first years of anarchy. The man reappeared a few years later when the situation had stabilized through fragmented communication. Ponomayarov had managed to reach out to his old boss, Soslov. As a man still resided in the WRRF's territory, it seems that the communist communists had told him to stay there as a liaison agent with the WRRF's officer clique. A few years passed before Soslov would call him back home. Upon arrival in Komi's capital, Mr. P began his political efforts. Outside of his speeches, Mr. P was a terminally boring man, nothing more than an old Soslovite. Automation or automaton, it seemed. The police continued their investigation. Perhaps a few more scraps of dirt could be gathered on him for matters of state security, of course. Uh, just another puppet, which helped us out quite a bit more. We got more rightist influence. Very good. And keep this open and see what's going on. We have nine days. The Infrastructure Repair Act. Love it. I still want to build new schools, though. Alright, let's do the Equal Zoning Act. Redistricting is a concern that has long affected many elements within our republic. From the disenfranchised refugees on the periphery peripheries of our cities to the politicians attempting to organize our re-elections. The process is infamously arduous within Komi and Siftivkar, specifically thanks to the bombings and high volume of population transfers thanks to refugees and our lack of resources to run accurate censuses. This naturally has led to an environment in which more or less any sort of population distribution can be constructed and made to look official, without cooking the books too much. Behind the curtain, the president has spoken to several deputies on the redistricting board, giving a favor to certain politicians to make them unassailable in their districts. Could be just the incentive they need to throw more of their support behind the government's initiatives. Yeah, we'll see what happens. And if I, like, cut my ties with this Zadanov guy, it's not going to be good for us, but the Infrastructure Repair Bill. As part of our new set of reforms, an increased amount of funding will go towards restoring the functionality of infrastructure damaged by German bombing, particularly paved roads, railways, and larger bridges. The problem is that if we follow the recommendations of the Democratic Coalition partners and commit to this without compensating for the very likely possibility of going over our very limited budget, we risk 
We risk. We risk running up debt, which is notoriously expensive due to our isolation from international credit. Yegor Ligachev of the DSNP believes he has found a solution after receiving assurances from Zedanov that the KKP will vote in support of any increase in income taxes necessary to fund the infrastructure repair bill. This will, however, be highly unpopular both with the people and with the Democratic Center. The passionaries, on the other hand, want to ensure that the repairs are done within the budget by utilizing our thousands of prison inmates as unpaid workers. Ooh! This suggestion would be most popular with the people, but the rest of the governing parties would see it as highly inhumane. Which proposal do we go with? Pass the tax hikes. Increase the uh, left with the Zendana support, unite the center, more stability infrastructure, or increase the economy right. Actually, what is our refugee, slavery, draft, military, social, economic, pensions, security, penal system? We currently on, are on incarceration. Stability, construction, spending factor, free repair, unite the center. If we do, the prisoners need exercise anyways, we go to penal labor. So we're currently in incarceration. So if we go down this way, we get 5% more population, better free repair, we get slightly less research speed, but it's only 1%. We actually get 5% stability, and you spend less on construction, and we get a free infrastructure? What's not to love? And currently, apparently, apparently, my cat just barged into the room and said, I want your chair. Cool. Right, Pink, you okay? Oh boy, Pinky. Come on, relax, Bink. Cool. The power struggle, 71, 65, 38, not bad. Uh... Cool, and Turkey declared one the Levant War in the Desert. Doesn't sound like a fun time. Cool, and we will not back down so easily. Ver oh, they're only half strength, holy crud. Look at that. No manpower. No, we actually have a little bit. They have no manpower, too. They have only one factory. They have two to four divisions. Ooh. Think. Always funny. But the enemy defeated. If you would like to read this, like I said in the last episode, if we get to events like this, because we're going to have these several times throughout the first few episodes here, go ahead and read them. But pretty much we won. So. Uh, now, to, on to cleaning up the corpses, we get political power, which is great stability and rifles. I love rifles. I hope you love rifles. Well, I get infantry equipment, really. Not bad. Two, minus 216. Not bad. The equal zoning act. Cool. Well, let's see. Encourage file sharing. We can't suppress the left. Can't get some more stuff here. That's fine. Save our political power up. The M Municipal Pacification Act. The paramilitary situation has been said to be getting completely uncontrollable with a general uptick in overall violence over time. Several politicians in the National Assembly, spearheaded by Svetlana Stalina and Alexei Kosygin, leaders of the Democratic Center, proposed a rather drastic bill, one that has been said to increase police powers within problem areas of the Republic to levels not seen since the days of Bukharin. While many politicians in the National Assembly have rallied against the bill, calling it a tyrannical government overreach and a naked attempt at shutting down political opposition to the current ruling parties, one can also argue that this opposition is just an attempt to prevent these politicians' illicit sources of assistance from being persecuted. Whether they like it or not, the bill will come up to a vote and it will come down to the democratic process. Nice. The Comprehensive Zoning Reform Bill. We have gained a stable enough majority in the National Assembly that we can redraft parliamentary districts in an equitable fashion. Yes, that sounds good. A very generous description of the Equal Zoning Bill on paper. The bill will ensure fairer representation by redrafting districts to be of equivalent geographical area rather than based on population alone, ensuring a better representation for the countryside, which generally leans centrist, over the population centers like Siktivkar. Now, of course, it is very possible that some districts may be more equal than others, and should we desire to instead benefit one of the opposition factions, for the purposes of our plans, it could be easily done by adding a provision allowing for smaller districts either in city centers, benefiting the KKP, or the suburban regions and smaller towns, benefiting the Passionary. How should we draft the bill? Binky, what do you say? Should we do the passionary? Should we do the city centers? Okay then, I, I understand. Well, if it keeps us safe from Suslov, for less favors, increase. Uh, hmm. Best of being Gribilov's good books increases the right. Oh, we have no need for enemies of the Republic. Ooh, ooh, that's a lot of negative political power. That is not bueno. But let's keep it in the good area. Secure control. Ooh, you know what? I want more stability. We got to get a lot of stability. And it seems like Binky's calmed down now. Finally. And we can only get 0.56 a day. Oh. Actually, keep an eye on this. Ooh, we can probably go to war with the Vologda. Ooh, Order St. George. Oh, Vyatka. Ooh, Vyatka. This is a little bit more guaranteed if we just fight these guys. So let's do this. These guys. Oh, we can do school stuff. Vyatka, now we good. 
At ah, midnight walk, Yuri shoved his hands in the pockets of his coat, a vain attempt to keep them warm as he trudged through the downpour. Almost ex reflectively, as Sang crawled around the grip of the gun that always sat in his right-hand pocket, he always carried at least two weapons on him, the knife in his boot and the Tokorov in his pocket. You never know who would be out to silence you in this town. Tokorovs are not bad weapons. Things were moving faster these days than they had in years. Lenin was certainly right about that. Sometimes, or s decades, happened in the span of weeks, the kid was a goddamn savant at the political game. Bukharina, now, he corrected himself. In just a few short weeks, she'd rapidly moved up in the party and had cemented herself as a force to be reckoned with. Something told Yuri she wouldn't stop rising there. She was like a goddamn force of nature in the party, one that Soslav was growing increasingly worried about, and therein lied Yuri's choice. Giving her a good word uh, to the general secretary would keep her safe for a while longer, and Yuri had a feeling she'd capitalize on that good investment. On the other hand, a part of him said to wait and see. If his feelings about her was right, she'd be able to claw her way to, to Soslav herself. Let her fight for her own battles. Put in a good word. Let her fight her own battles. I want, I want your pee-pee. The pee, pee Oh, they don't have... Oh, god dang it. Well, okay, well, then we have to go this way, then. So be it. My bad. Hope we can win against these guys. Hopefully they back down, but you never know. Not yet. Hopefully we can win. Give me more of that stability. Hey, look, more uh, manpower now. Hey, we're actually mobilizing a little bit more. Nice. It's probably because of the penal labor. I love penal labor. Initiate raid. Uh, give us, a, guys, just a little bit more time. There we go. Cool. And the defense of the Republic Act. The Komi Republican Army is a formidable force in the Russian waste, but has its own set of problems, namely its small size, due to our small population and necessary inefficient census system. The army doesn't get quite as much manpower as it needs from our current conscription policies. Several solutions have been raised in the National Assembly to address the issue and defend the Republic from hostile neighbors. While the official line of the ruling coalition is to increase the conscription period from one to two years, the left has proposed an addendum. A loosening of the laws that bans certain people from volunteering for military service due to participation in certain political organizations. While this is a drastic measure, it could assist the Republic in getting the manpower Needs. The solution, as always, will be decided in the National Assembly. The Municipal Pacification Bill. Svetlana has introduced the MPB, calling for vastly increased police funding and rights to use force to break up paramilitary movements, particularly ones involved in the street violence. It is a blatant broadside against communists and passionary, but it would go a long way in restoring order to the streets, however. Both the DSNP and the SNR are worried about the public re reaction. Killing the bill would make them look weak on crime, but endorsing would ensure its passage and make them seem to support police brutality and politicize attacks on their opponents. It remains to be seen what they do about the bill. Kill the bill in the committee, less manpower, more stability, or both endorse the bill passing it. Ooh. Uh, I kind of want to do this one, just so that we don't ban him. Ooh, does this hurt us in the future? Hopefully not, but that'll be. I think we'll be okay. I like the stability. I don't want to lose. I can't afford to lose manpower, so. And we get political power, which is nice. I'm tempted to do this at the same time, just because we might not get stability, but we get even more political power, but. Political power is pretty important. Train our troops, 1,000 manpower. Suppress the left, and eh, we can do it, why not? And there's one that gives us more j manpower, right? Because this one down here, hey, they paid the tribute, great. Great. Now, schools, research facilities, workers. Schools, research facilities, workers. Let's go with academic base. So with schools. Nice. Yeah, 75 political power is so much to get just a little bit more manpower. The Manifesto of Ordo Socialism. Suslov leaned forward in his office chair, pushing his glasses forward as he pinched the table as uh, the bridge of his nose. The leaflet of papers on the table lay before him scrambled, the text upon them hastily scrawled as if written by a man desperate or mad. The Manifesto of Ordo Socialism. So the first page, red and bright red lettering, neat and organized, a contrast to the rest of the work, a fact that Suslov found something somewhat amusing, although he cannot simply explain why. When Serov had pressed his theories to him and comrade Zadanov, Soslav was optimistic, though Serov was inarguably a brute. He was a loyal one, he wasn't ignorant of Marxism, though Soslav didn't quite expect the second coming of Lenin. He thought that the ex-NKVD chief would at least be de demonstrate some knowledge of socialism. Instead, he found horror. Soslav sighed and shuffled through the papers once again, and the churning in his gut only intensifying. Nothing about the manifesto was inherently wrong or reactionary, but Ser Serlov's or Serov's wording, particularly in regard to what he referred to as hereditary reactionaries, suggested something far more sinister than simple theory laid upon the surface of the manifesto. Sussos pushed himself away from his desk, stood quickly, hands quivering, and called for a messenger. Bring me Comrade Serov immediately. Oh, why do we lose political power, man? Come on. Actually, I kind of want to do this one too. As much as I want manpower, we need factories. Infrastructure would be pretty beneficial as well, but... Mm, mm, 
65, we could do that one. We could do military factories. I think we're going to wait because we're not actually building any right now. Resource-wise would be good. Cap, retention, base, output. Let's get more output. Batch production methods too. we got to get some more output. We just don't have enough of anything here. I think I'm going to try to get rid of another factory. Because this will be done. And hey, 1983. So we have about a little over 20 years before we can get that. But that's okay. Scam loot. Immediately do that. Help ourselves up as much as possible. 38, 65, 76. God dang. File sharing, if only. Discourage paramilitary violence? What? No. Oh, here it is. Public. There, this is exactly the one I want. I gotta do this one every time. Help out that poverty rate. He can now call in 23 favors. God dang. Suslov suppresses the manifesto. Ivan Serov nervously rubbed the back of his neck, hands nearly coated with a thin sheen of sweat as he stared up at the towering silhouette of Mikhail Suslov. On the Shadow Master's desk lay a manifesto, Serov's manifesto. He swallowed hard, trying in vain to stand fearless against what he had coming. Comrade Serov! Suslov's voice cut through the silence like a knife, even though he spoke barely above a whisper. This theory of yours... He paused. Serov saw an opportunity. Perhaps if he spoke fast enough, he could explain the revelations he had come to. I... You. Suslov spoke sharply, losing all pretense of neutrality. Again, Serov felt a dagger in his stomach. These musings of yours, comrade Serov, they suggest you are dreadfully misinformed about several things. You've been called here not for punishment yet, not yet, but... So we may correct this error. If it was anyone else before him, Serov would sharply challenge the notion that he wasn't being censured. But as he gazed into the cold steel of Suslov's eyes, words seemed to fail, for what seemed like hours. Suslov tore apart Serov's beloved manifesto, and in the end calmly banned him from spreading it under threat of party expulsion. Yet another weak man could, could take this lying down, but Serov was not a weak man. He didn't sleep that night or the next like a weak man would. Instead, he wrote, feverishly, almost maniacally. In the end, it would be worth it. Suslov would see, soon see, just how wrong he was. Show them all. Oh, man. Comey seems like to be an extremely divided but fun, interesting nation. TikTok, we gotta verify our clock. The Minority Representation Act. There lies a deeply concerning trend through our Republic of Inequality in the National Assembly. The majority of the deputies are Russian, with an extreme minority of the National Assembly made up of the peoples that the Republic bears the name of, the Comey. The proposed bill spearheaded by Svetlana Stalina's PSD makes a stand for a certain quota of minority representation with new districts drawn to ensure more minor minorities are sent to the National Assembly and the rich cultures of the Komi can be protected from a lack of representation, usually, though. Stalina and the left have aligned on this matter, and a large contingent of the Voznesti, the PSD, and the Communists supporting this measure. The fate of the bill seems to rest on the groups that can be rallied to support or oppose it. A more moderate bill could gain the support of more of the center, who are concerned about the political ramifications of mandated representation and marginalize the left. Ah, I love it. In defense of the Republic bill, the Republic has mandated conscription to defend itself, but the opposition is highly critical of the two-year draft system favored by the DSMP and the, S and the PSD. The current system has held for years as the SMR, despite being critical of conscription, accepted as a matter of national security now, however, in an unusual act of cooperation. The commies have endorsed the bill, first introduced by the Passionary, suggesting an alternative four-year conscription system, albeit with a provision for lower recruiting standards to ensure a bulkier army. With this alliance, the risk of more conservative PSD members defecting to vote with the Passionary, there's a very real chance a two-year model is under threat. The Assembly will need to pass a decision on the defense of the Republic Bill. The bill passes, including KKP provisions, more manpower. Ooh, we are currently on a two-year draft, are we? Social laws, economy laws, political and military. We are on a two-year draft. So, we're down here. If we go up to four-year draft, we get 0.5 more recruitable population. We lose stability, we lose war support, we lose more daily political power, we lose research speed, we lose more organization, recovery rate, factory output, dockyard output, and construction speed. The will passes where the KKP provision fails. Increases the influence of the left. The center holds. You know what? Where we're going, I'm, I need as much manpower as possible. And I almost never choose this to go higher in terms of conscription. At least I try not to too often. So, hey, look at that. 10,000 is not bad. But the next thing we've got to do, even though we did increase this influence of the left, there's only one time compared to all the other times we've been suppressing the left. So... The next thing we'll do is probably suppress the left again. Just for funsies. Ooh, Lord of St. George. Now they are ready to be beaten again. Come on, I just want to beat up St. George in his order. That's all. St. Georgino. Awesome. And we can finally go spreading red influence. Decreases influence of Suslov. Ah, oh, the militiamen strike. I'll do the spreading the spreading red influence. From the mundane restaurant conversations to the poll booths, talks and areas begin to take on a shade of red and gold, hammer and sickle. Those who speak of them in a positive light are no longer far leftists, but slowly also ordinary citizens. 
and the dissemination of communistic and socialistic propaganda must be halted through our paramilitaries and our own information for the citizens will replace it. Polling booths will become more guarded and suspected citizens shall be checked for any left-wing activities. We shall stop their efforts here. Voter intimidation? Don't mind if we do, maybe. Just a little bit. The mandated minority representation bill. It is a sad fact of life that in a republic centered on the Komi region that the actual Komi people and the other fendo uralic minorities in the republic are woefully underrepresented in the regional government and national assemblies and such. The Communist Party has introduced a bill enshrining the right of the natives to have a number of assembly seats proportional to their population in the republic, as well as a guaranteed right to the jobs in the government of majority native municipalities. Needless to say, passing this bill would strengthen the communists considerably as they are already doing well among the natives and this bill would enshrine them as a party of native rights. As such, the passionaries want the bill voted down on the grounds of man mandatory rep native representation, being undemocratic in a system preaching one man, one vote. Of course, in reality, their chief concern is the threat of a strengthened communist party could present. As a compromise, the native Komi SMR representative Ivan Morozov has, or Morozov has drafted a bill that would guarantee the natives access to local government and heavier vote weight in assembly elections, but no mandatory lower limit on native uh, representation. The Senate has rallied around this proposal, though many in the SMR and DSMP are clearly more sympathetic to the Communist mandated minority representation bill. What will the Assembly conclude? Pass in full, an excellent idea. Equal rights with affirmative action. You lose political power, more non core manpower, which is not bad. At lose stability, we can learn from lessons here. We get political power, or we lose stability, we lose political power, and increases the right. Well, we kind of have to take this one. This is pay patently discriminatory against Russians. No, they're not necessarily wrong, right, Beak? Right, Beak, you like looking at yourself, huh? Do you discriminate against people? No, he discriminates against everything. Ah, uh, scavenge for loot. We currently have no other protection money. We shouldn't have to do this. Comes in, turned around to face Turban. His face filled with disgust and self-loathing as he walked down the street. We don't have a choice, responded Comes in, stopping as a communist campaign truck passed by, filled with adoring children, unless we want to starve or worse. That doesn't make it right. Right, wrong, it doesn't matter. It should. Well, it doesn't. Shut up, they're just ahead. They stopped in front of an alley. The place of their meeting, looking down it, they saw a man inside, entirely colorless except for the red sickle and hammer band on his right arm. Comzi stepped inside, leaning against the opposite building of the men. You got the money? Comzi nodded, nicking, taking out a folded up collection of rubles. The man took them, counted it, and then pocketed it. Don't worry, he said, getting up and smiling. We don't give a crud about what you uh, uh, f words do. I don't know. Then as he was about to walk away, he turned around, smiling. Just leave the children alone. You guys are okay in our book. We'll keep that in mind, Comzin said, keeping his eye on Turban. Good, have a fine day, comrades. As he walked away, like he did at the end of every month, after payment. At least you're getting protection. Protection's nice. But is it the right type of protection? Disease is not good. <laughs> so, Sislav's influence is significant. Zidana's is moderately low, and Bukharina, well, she's kind of irrelevant. Bukharina and Stalina. Svetlana, 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 Svetlana. Oh, there we go. That's three, five hundred more manpower. Hasten army recruitment. I will cut ties eventually. Because eventually this guy, Zadana, does call in favors. So, yeah. That's not going to do a good thing for our popularity as President V here. But I don't really care. This guy's okay. I mean, you lose political power and stability. But you do get more consumer goods to work with. Even though technically right now we can't really use it that much. Go figure. Uh, nope. Actually, I don't mind trying this once. Usually it doesn't work. We can try to do this. Spend 10 political power. Which I'm pretty sure they're going to say no or just say like, Oh, sorry, we ran out of your money or we can't give you stuff. And, oh, oh, wait, never mind. They actually work. So, men shout in the distance, retreating from the patch of trees and shrubbery handpicked by the Colonel Utkin. That early morning, the few stars peeking through the rising sun's glare along the gentle fa falling snowflakes were not strong enough to pierce beauty through the grisly set of a bloodstained forest as a cloudy mist of Russian blood spread through the trees there. Deep within the Russian wilderness, Koma Utkin found himself alive, his men alive, and every single would-be marauder of his fine homestead and village on the run or lying dead in the snow, everyone stood silent, taking in their first victory in months, their first chance to make a stand against the Russian attacker who so greatly pillaged their lands for so long. The men threw down their rifles, hugged one another, and cheered the heavens over their newfound victory against the murderous sleeves who plagued them for so long. Konla Utkin, however, took a minute to inspect the bodies. Boys, the least of which must have been sixteen. A prime age for cadets before the rise of the Soviets, perhaps, but the cold, lifeless eyes reminded him of that day when Russia would war no longer. Cheers and cries greeted the party of guards as they entered their settlement once again, this time having tasted their first victory against the men who tore their land asunder for so long. However, 
over. While the rest of the men enjoyed family and taverns, Colonel Utkin made his way up to his office, grading himself to congratulate the man truly in charge of the victory. Spinning the rotary, Colonel Utkin waited. Yes, Mayor Consul Dragunov. This is Colonel Utkin. I wish to report the lives you saved with your most recent transaction with our government. Excellent, Dragunov. Oh. Do we actually get this stuff? Holy crap. That was not bad. We actually can't, I can't believe that. Whoa. Cool, we can share the wealth, share the factories, because we need more support equipment as well. And we're now barely making some anti-bank, anti-tank equipment. If we can get another one more factory to get support equipment, then we can have a production for enough stuff here, for the most part. They call me Republican Navy. Oh, boy. Let's go and do the observe leftist paramilitaries. In our nation, marching paramilitaries down the street may as well be our way of greeting each other. The paramilitary is the lifeblood and invisible hand of every party, including our own, and every plotter with a bit of sense knows it. Because of the status and importance of the paramilitary in a republic, simply watching what their thugs do and say will grant us access to valuable information regarding their plans. Through agents and citizens' observations, we can figure out when and where the army is, or the enemy is, from hour to hour. The Komi Republican Navy, General Ivan Korolkov, Slowly paced down the Sisola docks, Defense Minister Ligachev and six Republican guards in tow. The waters of the river which nourished Siktivkar and Kotlas, and from the Republic's border with the front were calm, clear, and placid in the fall air. The object of Korolkov's attention, however, was no placid vessel. It was a gunboat, the first of the docks of Siktivkar had purpose-built. Mounted machine guns ringed her hull, and a single 85mm cannon graced her front deck, taking up a majority of the available space. To the assembled military men, she was a beautiful sight to be, to be seen. A beautiful solution to the ugly problem of piracy and smuggling. Give the dock workers my congratulations since began Korolkov, surveying the radio antenna on her stout command center. They could shift not it. They've been paying double for laying her down. We'll get you another four. Provided funding sold up for two for the Sisola and two for the Vyatka. The newly promoted commander officer, commanding officer of the Komi Republican Navy stared intently into the water. Yes, this would do nicely. All his lobbying and harassing the defense minister had finally managed to procure a solution, and he was damn well going to show what river supremacy could do for the Republic. It's an honor, minister. Ooh, naval XP? And we get a never. A, 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 ooh, a river guy. Oh, you didn't hear anything. My bad. Whoopsie. Nothing, nothing. Oh, wow, that looks. Oh man, holy crud. Ah, so we're doing payment to the Zausts. Zlatausts. Yep, vacuum tube computing, even more research speed. Because that'll help out with getting more batch production methods. Wow, that looks so bad. Public education, early mobilization, four year draft really does hurt us quite a bit. Nikolai doesn't isn't good for us. Widespread cronyism, the clash of the shadows. I mean, we're still they're still at 38, which is pretty low, which is good. 83 is pretty good for the election, so not too worried about that. Even if we don't supp suppress the left again, I think we'll still do okay. Uh, what do we have here? Has one money? Has one money? Has one money? No one has money or treasure, guys. Guys. Oh, request from Zidanov. Oh, crud! No, no, no. If not selected, we lose stability. Oh, uh, request from Zidanov, so be it. It's gonna hurt us, actually, quite a bit. A charitable donation, Vosnesensky entered his office and noticed an unmarked letter on his desk. He cautiously opened the letter and began to read. Vosnesensky knew immediately that Zidanov had another demand to ask of him. To my dearest friend, President V, and I feel that Siktiv Kilar has been corrupted by greed. They need an example. Leaders show them the virtue of charity. I've gone through the trouble of selecting a suitable organization. I feel that in order to make the message hit closer to home, that the donation should be the equivalent to the 10,000 US dollars. That was a lot of money to simply donate out of the blues. Zidanov was clearly getting more ambitious with his demands. I hope you make the right choice. Sincerely, your friend Zidanov. The charity Zidanov had selected was, was owned by family with personal ties to Svetlana Pokharina. If the president accepted their demand, he might as well have been paying the Communist Party directly, of course. The president wasn't stupid. If he refused, Zidanov would surely release his compromat on him. He pulled the checkbook out of a drawer in his desk, but paused as he uncapped his pen. Should he do what was best for himself, or should what he do what was best for the Republic? If the information in that compromat was released, the president's career was probably over. With quivering hands, he put the nip in the paper and watched the ink flow. Let's hope this doesn't blow up in our faces. Oh, come on. Support equipment is gone? Uh, let's see. We actually didn't have any, so that's okay. Woo! We were saved by incompetence. Yeah, I'm just gonna cut ties, probably. Since we did the budget focuses, though, we might have an extra little bit of time. Oh, boy. Oh, good. Thank goodness. We might have a little bit of extra time to get another boost to poverty rate. Nice. Three a month is not great, but better than nothing. The casualty. Valery 
Mezlauk exited the National Assembly and made his way to his car, his car had been provided for him by the DSMP, considering his status as a deputy of an important swing district. He understood that there was a plenty of factions who wanted his district, but Valerie was no fool. Valerie Me Mezlauk had been involved in politics since before the Russian Revolution, and he continued to win elections despite his advanced age. As he stepped off the curb to cross the street, he felt something hit him in the chest. Someone nearby began to shout, and his fellow deputies ran for cover. Valerie stood there in his confusion. Dispelled, his blood began to stain his coat. He began to lose his balance, his knees were giving out from beneath him. Soldiers shouting in the sound of gunfire, a sniper on the roof. The color was seeping from the world, and Valerie knew that the people rushing to his body were too late. He knew that he would never touch his wife again. He ignored the chaos surrounding him, finding happiness in thinking of his wife. He smiled as he thought of her face. Her warmth and the darkness overtook him. Valerie Mezlaw had been shot and killed. The government escaped in the scene before they could be identified. Emergency elections would have to be held in Ms. Locke's former district in order to fill a seat. He was a good man. Oh, man. Well, that's not ideal. But then again, I just want to raid my enemies. Because even though they don't loot, that's okay. An ideological abomination. The letter had arrived in the early hours of the morning, a time which Soslav would have preferred, much preferred, to spend asleep with his wife. Thus, when the courier had nervously knocked on the door and quickly handed him the paper, Soslav had steeled himself to write, read the contents, and yet nothing could have prepared him for the horrors of him. Serov had gone quite mad, and it was the only explanation Soslav could believe. No traces of blank white paper remained on the letter he held. Only the erratic ravings of a man scorned, the manifesto of auto socialism flirted with revisionism, this new monstrosity was practically wet the reaction. He read with horror at first, as Serov detailed, the valuable lessons to be learned from the thus far superior ideology of the German and how the, and how the Communist Party would do well to adapt the tactics of victory, which, as far as Serov seemed concerned, referred mostly to the extermination of hereditary reactionaries, state-sponsored corporations, and a promotion of German racial theory. Sosov nearly slammed the paper on his desk, hand quivering not with horror but with rage now as visions of German tanks and camps flashed through his mind. A snarl raked or snaked across his lips as he pushed himself to his feet. Serov had gone too far. This was not the question of an uneducated socialist but the deranged lunacy of a fascist. Sosov barely noticed the surroundings as he stormed through his office and punched a number into his telephone. A counselor had infected his party and he knew that he would see it excised at any cost. The dragon reveals itself. No, my political power! No! No! Why do you pain me so with such penalties? Ah! Oh. Right, hey, we got one in spare. Up to uh, left to spare militaries and the strike from the right. Even if they are helping us defeat the leftist threat, it seems that the situation on the right has not developed to our advantage. While we have been dealing with the communist threat, it seems that the fascists have taken advantage of this opportunity to expand their influence and scope. Much like the left, talks of new graffiti, voter intimidation, and paramilitary assaults from Gumilov have spread throughout our political sphere and sh shows no sign of stopping anytime soon. A meeting must be called and a plan to deal with this new threat must be drafted and carried out. We are still in 62, yet we're already 36 minutes-ish into this video. Us militiamen strike. The Army of the Republic has always been, in theory at least, an apolitical organism. Soldiers swear an oath to uphold the Constitution and defend the Republic from outside threats. Yet in practice, there was a revolving door between political paramilitaries and army garrisons. Many politicized youths joined the Army to learn the art of violence, only to seek further employment in the militias after they left their tour of service. Others joined the Army in between the stints in the streets of the capital, often to let the heat die down after recent militia clash. Today, a group of communists leading soldiers have announced an unlimited strike to protest the government's violence against the far left. Why has the government gone back on its words and broken the truce with the communist parties? Why are noble men of the Republican army sent to die for political bickerings? Asked the speaker to assembled soldiers. A chorus of indignation lifted up the question as policemen observed the public protest. Numbers are still coming in, but it seems that their initial guess that one-third of the army's communist leanings has proven accurate, down to 66% of its usual strength, and with all the tank corps joining in, joining the strike, our army has been badly hit by the strike. We will not have truck with traders. Bring in the reserves. Cool. I just want to smash people. The replacements. The barracks do not remain empty for long. Drill surgeons oversee push-ups and rifle drills as government bureaucrats monitor the inclusion of former right-wing paramilitaries into the army. The left, the far left, has inevitably protested the recruitment of reactionary thugs into the army, depicting this as the latest example of the inevitable alliance between spineless capitalist liberals and reactionary fascists. These protests have been drowned out in turn by a tidal wave of outrage from parties ranging from the Social Democrats to the far right. The communist thugs have deserted their posts in this hour of need, pointed out a fascist a deputy to a mixture of applause and jeers. The fascist paramilitaries are known to maintain their own strict standards of training and obedience. The new recruits are generally of excellent quality, yet many observers worry that by switching the government's reliance on one set of political extremists to another, the Republic's safety has not been improved. How long until the new recruits agitate for their own purposes? They get what they get. They're better than Suslov. Ooh. They get what they get. They're better than Suslov. Let's see they're better than Suslov. Why not? Removing the cans. Effective immediately as a result of his repeated infractions against Marxist theory, spreading of unauthorized theory and fascist sympathies, Ivan Alexandrovich 
Alexandrovich Serov is hereby banned from the Communist Party of Komi, including the right to attend meetings, speeches, party housing and employment, and a party-sponsored workplace. Sislav watched impassionately as Adonov glanced, uh, signed his name at the bottom of the letter, glancing to the bodyguards and party officials in attendance. Zadonov, to his credit, had nearly ar immediately arrived at headquarters and agreed to sign the letter of expulsion, something Sislav took precious satisfaction with. Though he could feel the growing distance between his old mentor and himself every day, at least he stood united against the reaction. Zadonov placed the pen on the table and gestured towards Sislav as he approached. Taking the pen in his hand, Sislav sighed ever so quietly as he signed his own name, just below Zadonov's. Leave us, he commanded, and the officials and bodyguards followed unquestioningly, leaving him and Zadonov alone. He will retaliate, Mikhail, Zadonov spoke after a moment of silence. You know, I know. You have the list of those sympathetic to him? Yes, they will receive similar letters, of course. Sislav nodded. A Nazi in our own party. It should have been seen earlier. This needs to be kept quiet, Andri. Without waiting for the other men to respond, Sislav was gone, gliding through the streets of the party's neighborhood like a ghost. Gumilov will love this. Uh, Shafarovich's surge. Not all the news recruits were far-right radicals. A good quantity of conservative-affiliated militias have joined the army. This has been news for Sha Shafarovich. Members of the conservative party on the left of the Passionary, an occasional ally of the government. Now supporters had held a non-trivial position in the Republican army. Shafarovich's political star, as tainted as it was by his associated Gumilov, had risen sharply. His temporary partners in the Democratic coalition have not reacted much to this new reality as the military is, supposedly a politically neutral organization. However, in Comey, a ministerial reshuffle is never far away, and a new conservative ministry might go a long way towards reaching out to the government's new partner. Communist politicians, on the other hand, have not been happy to see the rightists gain new supporters. Rumors on the left is that the so-called traditional democratic militias are secretly filled with fascists and gumilayevists. If true, the conservative soldiers would not be any significant obstacles to a far-right takeover of the army. Surely, it won't go anywhere. Surely, this can't be a problem. Surely, I just want a raid here. And which we gotta get research facilities next, so. Because other than that, we got everything done. I just want some research facilities. Can I go fight, 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 fight? Still 62, man. Getting through this one is uh, takes a little, little bit of time. But that's TNO in a nutshell. Oh, look at this. Someone did recommend I play as Magnitogorsk. We'll see what happens, I don't know. Led by Lesenko, huh? Looks like a crazy guy. You got Lufthansa terror bombings. You got mad scientists. Ooh. The sanity is average. Supply, production efficiency, not bad. And very low NKVD influence. Oh, that's pretty good for him, then. That's pretty good, yeah. Pre oh, there we go. Prepare raid, yes. All I want to do is raid and have a good time. But to have a good time, we must raid. I know it's a very difficult thing to do. And that new face? Apparently, due to our efforts to crack the left, a split in their parties developed. While this is a good for us, very much so, a conundrum has appeared. We do not know the exactly who is exactly splitting the communists. The person has already gained much influence in the party, and that much is already known. Said person also was reportedly once Lieutenant Asuslov and has never broken away on his or her former own accord. And whoever this person is now wields much power on the left. Anything about this new leader is derived from those three tidbits of information, and that is all. We must try to figure out who this new contender in the political game of Komi is, and quickly, before this new splinter of the left moves to attack. A new face increased fascist activity. Komi's far right has always been a force to be reckoned with, not as big as the government's democratic militias, nor as big as Suslov's web of far left. No good, Nix. The fascist militias had still maintained a respectable fighting strength, drilling their men frequently and accumulating as many weapons as possible. The far right had earned their place as the third pillar of Comey's defensive forces. From there, the fascist paramilitaries had adapted themselves well to the stalemate. They acquired a few quarters of the capital for their own purposes and often clashed with Democrats or Communists. <clears throat> Their big break has been given to them by the government's recent battles with Suslov's forces. Under Gerson, communist or democratic districts have been taken over by the far right. Weapon convoys rolled between various fascist sectors as every area the far right got its hand on was reinforced by fresh militiamen. In parallel to the military offensive that had come, a propaganda offensive. The democratic's pathetic attempt at crushing the decadent far left would come back to haunt Comey, the radio announcer claimed. Had the communist night squandered two opportunities to defeat the Germans already, the democratic coalition was impotent to stop the spread of the communist blight. Only hard men could imagine these difficult times. The takeover of new areas by fascist militias was only preventative, meaning or meant to save citizens from the communist menace. So what? So went the far right's propaganda campaign, where one falls, another rises. Cool. More ultra-nationalism, which is not there, but there. Nice and dark. Is that black? I guess it's black. It's a different type of black to this black here. 
left Volznesti threatens to split. This is an outrage. Even as a t rising tide of fascism threatens to drown the Republic, the government insists on fighting the communists? Has President gone mad? Or is he merely capitulating to the fear mongers of the Liberal and Conservative Party? <clears throat> The speech was booed by the majority of the Democratic Party, but a worrying percentage of the Social Democratic representatives cheered the speech. The majority of the Social Democrats' left wing had been grumbling for weeks now that the fascists were left free to rampage. Now the grumblings had ended in an openly mutinous feeling had swept through the left of the Volznesti. Rumors of a motion and the campaign on the far left had spread throughout the assembly, worryingly. Rumors of mass defections to the communists had also begun to spread. The Social Democrats were the biggest party of the ruling coalition, yet the loss of the party's left wing would not be good for the president's party. A loss of the majority that allowed the coalition to rule a nation would likely follow, and that with the specter of a paralyzed government would unable to deal with any criticisms. An absurd demand. Cool. Italy wins the Italo Turkish War. Oh, good job, Italy. Karal Karak al. Pakistan. Cool. A hanging thread? Vosnesky's whips, party whips, have been working overtime to put the fear of God into their mutineers. As it turned out, all this effort risk being for naught. Alarms were first raised when the Social Democrats' left wingers refused any attempt at compromise. Several representatives that had been once open to compromise with the center, center right had now turned into hardliners. No amount of threats, negotiations, or bribes could coerce them back into line. The increasing suspicious party whips turned to less official channels. The party's members' phones lines were tapped, just as, or taped, or tapped, just as paramilitary agents tracked the mutineers' every moves. Eventually, a pattern began to emerge. Almost half of the mutineers were receiving instructions directly from Suslov and his communists. <clears throat> This development had turned the mutiny crisis into a looming catastrophe. The Communists had planted a hard kernel of dissenters within the Social Democrats for just an, such an eventuality. As the Social Democrats' left wing is riddled with Suslovite agents and those gullible enough to follow them, it is impossible to negotiate with them. The government's loss of its majority has now become imminent. Everyone is compromised. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, that's a lot of manpower. And we're still mobilizing. Good. Keep mobilizing. Keep it up. The Olive Branch. Zidana felt a little apprehensive writing his letter. There was always a thrill, a slight pang of fear upon jumping into the unknown. His partnership with the president had been friendly all these years and had been comfortable to slowly build up the republic as well as develop its communist party. But now the movements of Gumilov, Suslov, and the democratic war hawks required Zidana to step up his own game, thus his declaration of war as a quest for peace. <clears throat> the president would receive a humble proposal of peace. <clears throat> Would it not be better for if the enemies of reaction united their forces to smash the fascist paramilitaries? The end of the government's assault on the communist paramilitaries would prevent the fascists from gaining strength. It also safeguarded the less own power for Zidanev enjoyed knowing the communists had significant firepower. One day, perhaps, Suslov's grip would be wrenched away from the paramilitaries, and their ownership would be transferred to Zidanev? This development would have to wait, however. Before that would come, the division of the Democratic Party as the liberals and conservatives would lash out against the Social Democrats for letting the communists go free. Uh, Vosnesky would be a victim of his attempt to broker peace with the left. In this regard, the president might choose to reject peace. It would be a clever move, and the president was a clever man. The president would never suspect that his old mentor and longtime associate would dare burn up their partnership and reveal the president's ties to the left. Such a revelation would cause, uh, immensely hurt the president, but Zdanov suspected he wouldn't even have to go this far, after all. That wily snake Suslov had many trump cards of his own, better let Suslov engineer a collapse of the government. This way, Zdanov could keep his very best cards for a few more turns. The winner of the game, after all, might very well be the last man to make a move. Obey. On the other hand. On the other hand. Yes. Very good. I like that one. We are quite divided. This reminds me of Kaiserreich United States a little bit. <sighs> Sergei. O V I R. Empty seats in Congress. Comey's Legislative Assembly began its meeting today barely above quorum. A vast number of deputies of the leading Democratic coalition failed to show up. Worryingly, almost all were members of the left wing of the President's Social Democrats. Party whips were also conspicuously absent the entire morning. In the back corridors of the Legislative Assembly, the Democratic factions insiders exchanged urgent whispers about the situation. In the afternoon, the missing deputies came in after the lunch break. Without a word, the men and women of the Assembly picked up their chairs and offices and dragged them to the Communist side of the Assembly. The rain of jeers and boos from the former Democratic colleagues did nothing to hinder their progress. The far right and far left observed the situation carefully. A few communists exchanged written memos, but none spoke publicly. Once the commotion was dealt with and order was restored to the assembly, the Democratic coalition's majority no longer existed. While neither the communists nor the fascists made a big case of it, the government now lived on borrowed time. At any moment, a vote of no communists could go through to bring the previously impervious Democratic coalition. And bring it down. Call up Shafarovich. We can wait for the next election. election. Call him up. Yeah. Silence. No news from the president. Zidana was not surprised. Perhaps a little disappointed to see his own partner chose to do this a hard way, but the communist politician knew that the easy days were over. 
The first order of business was to sever some more problematic ties with the president. Zidanev had long exchanged information and other goodies with his partner as continuous proofs of goodwill. Now the street would have to be cut back to keep the pressure on. The usual methods of communications would also be adjusted aside from a few emergency channels. Vosnesky would also see that the old days of, of continuous access to one another were a thing of the past. These few acts of housekeeping done, all Zidanev could do was wait. He was fairly certain Suslov would come up with a solution to the current fruitless battle between the communists. Vosnesky was a fool if he thought the status quo could continue endlessly in Comey's endless games of political espionage. The president might one day be shocked to learn that his democratic coalition might not be as secure as he'd like. Good riddance. Yeah, he's got 2% support. I'm not going to say that's pretty good. That's pretty bad. Not going to lie. Oh yeah, we're going to do that too. I've been reading so many events, I forgot about this. And they refuse to be great. So, Zidanev watched the, tea kettle, watched the kettle heat up. The officers... Samovar had run out of water for the team. Hence, the politician had left his office to fetch some more. The gas flame licked the kettle, rendering it red hot in the badly lit communal kitchen. Inside the steel kettle, pressure was rising to a fever pitch. The abandon of the Social Democratic Party left by its left wing had brought Comey's fragile status quo to the brink. Now, pressure was wheeling up in, within the Legislative Assembly as a Democratic coalition desperately searched for a pathway to, to a new majority. Zidanev had not heard of Wozniewski's since, since the sudden betrayal. It was not difficult to imagine that the president's mind was at, at the moment rage at being undercut by the communists, anguish at the thought of his ties with Zidanev coming to life. Now might be the best moment for Zidanev to push against the president to weaken him further before the left could bring a final breakdown to the coalition. By threatening a full reveal of the connection, Zidanev could try to extract some concession or another, such as tax free communist district. This would further weaken the president and estrange him from his allies, but the communist politician knew that the president was a proud man and was equally likely to resist any further attempt at blackmail. That might prove another worthwhile scenario for the president to refuse it. further cooperation with Zidanev, he might not live the week politically. Zidanev surmised that the Social Democrats' allies would not remain allies for long of a president that had brought their government to the abyss. The kettle's whistle brought Zidanev out of his reverie. Yes, his former pro former protege was stuck in a pressure chamber of his own making. The least that Zidanev could do was bring him out of it at the first opportunity, or at least do so when it would be most profitable to Zidanev's own ascension to the top. Absolutely not. Request from Zidanev. Indulge him in his latest request. Sure, why not? Screw it. We're going to do it. Great, successful. Use all we can do. Great. And research facilities. Thank you. Beautiful. Just put him against Vyatka because we can. Cool. So, a release SMR strategy. The phone in the president of private city rang. Vosnetsky almost had, or jumped out of his chair. The phone was practically never in use. He picked it up hesitantly. Hello? Hello, Nikolai. It is me, your cousin Andre. Vosnetsky cursed under his breath. God dang, Zidanov. Andre, how did you get this number? It is not magic, cousin. Listen, I have to ask you a favor. As you may know, I've been preparing for a long time to put on a really great show for Baba soon. Show him a really great party, but then I hear of our friend Alexei has been organizing his own party and it might steal all the attention. That is hardly fair. I wondered if maybe you could get to him to tell you his plans for certain parts of the park where our two parties might overlap a fair bit, so we can know what events he's got planned. That way, things would be better for everyone, yes? I... <clears throat> I don't know, Andre. I understand what you mean, but Alexei is a dear old friend of mine. I'm not sure if we can do that to his party. Nikolai, please, just a quick peek at his plans. Just, uh, just a small peek, a small peek. You know, you, you over me a favor. You owe me a favor, and I've already helped you a lot, as you know. Let us keep on doing that and really surprise Baba, yes? A secretary knocked at the door to, stu to the study. Mr. Vosnesky, uh, Alexei Kosygin is here to see you about the electoral redistricting. I'll be out in a moment, Lumid Lumidlia? Ludmilla. Listen, Cousin Andre, fine, I'll do it. We wouldn't want to disappoint Baba. Who needed political power? Political power is a tool of... The people? I don't know. Food for the hungry. And if you want to read this, that's just the results of the last battle, so. That's nice. You might as well go for that. I might might prefer actually going the other way, but whatever. A new face? Oh boy. And the interlude. It seems if only for a temporary period of time that things have finally calmed down again. The plotters have retreated out in the, of the public eye, most, most likely so that they can continue plotting in the dark. The streets have become quite tranquil, and the legislative sessions are less and less chaotic. There is, however, a reason for the calm. Soon, democracy will once again be tested in collections throughout the Republic of Komi. Each and every faction that wishes to see their leader in power must now plan and consult a calculating public support and paramilitary control of areas. The time of movement has ended. The time of strategizing has begun. 
Excuse me, I had to sneeze, so I read that one a little bit more quickly. The Doctor of the Soviet Union. Welcome back, comrades, to Radio Prav Pravda. My name is Andrei Zadanov, your humbly elected deputy of the Communist Party, and your host for today. This occasion is special indeed, for I am joined by my fellow deputy and comrade Svetlana Pokharina, who has graciously allowed us to conduct an interview. Thank you, comrade Zadanov. It's an honor to be here. Now, comrade Bukhara, Bukharina. What exactly brought the esteemed daughter of Nikolai Bukharin himself to a place like Komi? Well, for the longest time, all I did was drift with the breeze. I had lost track of everyone I'd known in the collapse, even my own father. I had nowhere to go. What did you see out there? Horrible, horrible things. Desperate people willing to do anything for a bite to eat. Fascist bombers grounding entire communities into dust. Not to mention banditry and barbarism of the highest degree. Sounds like what we're dealing with right now, almost. Indeed, I arrived in Komi just as Operation... Suvorov kicked off, and I was there to witness the collapse of the front. Despite my efforts, the horrors I witnessed back east had managed to follow me here. I decided at that moment I was going to do something about it rather than continue to flee. Do you think you've got you've achieved that goal, comrade? Not yet. Oh, the daughter of the Soviet Union. Ah, uh, the shadow opens. There was no more time for doing nothing. Enough suspicion and political will has moved us to investigate Suslov and the organizations he has under his influence. Though some may see the surface of his charitable organizations devoted to the cause of socialism with nothing more than a thought of praise, we would not be satisfied with such a shallow judgment. Even his other organizations shall not be freed from the scrutiny we wish to employ. Just like the man himself, these still reek of rumors and reports with which we must confirm. Turning over the stone upon which these all rest shall be instrumental to the smooth sailing of our own plans. Let us focus on B on the people who act under his thumb. While we may be wise to see what places he may have extended his influence into or learn about whatever resources he may have exploited through his organizations, it pays to study them. The more we learn about these people, the more we learn about Suslov, and the more we learn about both of them, the more we learn about the real purpose of these organizations. One could get lost in the blackness. Ooh, very good. Left, left, more right. Well, 100, 50, 31. The Communist Party's rising star. Mikhail Soslav browsed the various poll results in front of him. The subject of the poll was Svetlana Bukharina, who quickly becoming who was quickly becoming the new face of the Communist Party. Voters continued to love her, proving that her landslide victory from when she first was elected was not just a fluke. Ever since Soslav had decided to start promoting her, promoting her more and more, the Communist Party continued to grow. Svetlana Bukharina was beginning to become a major political entity in Komi. However, her popularity was not just limited to the citizens of Komi. Her competence, her as a daughter of General Secretary Bukharin, and her friendly, polite demeanor all made her popular within the Communist Party itself. She became the most popular amongst the younger politicians and the reformists, but also lacked any major opponents within the party. This was good news for the party, and more importantly, good news for Soslav. Svetlana Bukharina appeared to be exactly what the Communist Party needed, especially with the elections just around the corner. Congratulations, Svetlana! No, there's two Svetlanas. I just realized that. My goal is at least get through this part of the focus tree, and it's still 62. Oh, Communist Revolt in Levant. A revolution in the Holy Land, eh? A power play? Valen Valentin Ivanovich, I want you to be frank with me. Soslov began staring across his office desk at his visitor. Is it doable? Yes! Varendekov answered. A brief, loaded silence followed. Assuming our intel is correct, and Gumilov does, in fact, have no more than 20 or so men guarding his printing presses at night. He paused again, not to imply that our boys couldn't handle being outnumbered, especially with surprise on our side, just that, you know, there is a limit. Soslov sighed. Has the plan changed at all since you talked to Ops... Oplesnin regarding transportation? Yes, we've procured a truck. The plan is now to break in via the Kuratov Street loaded loading dock. Our armed men will deal with any resistance, and then these two arsonists who were paroled last night, or last month, will soak the place with gasoline and light it. With any luck, the building will be gutted before the fire brigades can arrive and will be long gone. Varandikov nodded deferentially to his boss. It's your decision, comrade, general secretary. Commit everything? There's no shame in reservation. Ah, yeah. Let's get out of our deficit of political power. That'd be nice. A disastrous operation. Please explain to me how this happened, Soslov answered dispassionately as he brandished the front page of the paper. Gubelov's press is attacked by communist slugs in an alleged arson scheme. Varenikov's eyes bulged as his face signed into a grimace. Karma General Secretary, last night's events were a result of an intelligence failure that betrayed our plan to Gumilov's forces. The paramilitary leader sighed. Those arsonists, as it turned out, were right-wing sympathizers and promptly sang like canaries the instant they were brought on board. As a result, there were 30 men and a maximum gun waiting behind the door when their people arrived. Survivors? None, except for the arsonists. They ran off with Gumilov's men. The truck was destroyed as well. Thank you for the information, Comrade Sosov said in a measured tone. You may go now. Call Bukharina. We must keep the red flag flying. The situation is under control. Ooh. Let's say the situation is under control. We don't need to get her involved for now. Just because we can. 
our newest champion, Svetlana Bukharina, had all the qualities of a leader, charismatic, competent, calculating. However, Mikhail Soslov couldn't simply justify choosing to back her as a party's future candidate. She was becoming too popular, too influential, and she was becoming a threat to Soslov's position as a leader of the Communist Party. She was quickly becoming the leader of the reformists within the Communist Party, revisionists whose influence Soslov had attempted to limit in the past. Bukharina was ambitious, and Soslov had determined long ago that such people were not reliable. Instead, Suslov needed someone who could pu could be a public face and who could follow orders. The solution, Boris Ponomaryov, who had already served as a counterbalance to Zadonov. He was a competent administrator, an affable puppet, and a born follower. He was perfect for the role Suslov needed to fill. It was time to make it official. Boris P. would formally be backed as a Communist Party's candidate for the foreseeable future. Great. You know what, it worked last time. Oh, Bakharina's letters. There's almost an event, like... Once every four days. Holy cow. Comrade, I write you this letter to express my most sincere gratefulness for the warm welcome to both the Republic of Komi and its capital, and for the warm welcome to their party. I've never felt so welcomed in a political sense before. It is with great happiness that I announced my candidacy for deputy in our legislature, and it was with great happiness that I accepted my seat, both in the party and that chamber. I am pleased to work beside such noble comrades as yourselves and under the gentle guiding of Comrade Suslov. It is thus that I inform you of my other purpose of this letter. I see in my heart of hearts a most prosperous future for the three of us, and I believe that in a surely far-flung future where Comrade Sosov does not occupy his current position, we could find a most re reasonable accord. From Svetlana Bukharina. Ooh. Increases the influence of Zadanov. Ooh, I don't want to increase Zadanov, so... Here we go, that guy. I just want to scan for loot, man. This... Like, literally, like, almost, it's like one event a day now. The spider's web, the political party was like a spider's web. In some strange way, every thread, like every member, had its place. Mikhail Suslov was more familiar than most with his philosophy. He supposed he was like a spider of sorts. He built the web, he maintained the web, and if any outsiders were trapped within the web, they would seem destroyed of light. As carefully maintained an orderly cobweb who tremored on the winds of fate, and a growing worry that he was not the only spider that claimed it as their own. Mr. P, ever the loyal sycophant, had reported to him as he had on all of the nights one stormy evening, but when Suslov asked him about Svetlana Bukharina, the hesitation before he spoke, dismissing her as a threat and suggesting Suslov had turned his eyes elsewhere? More than that, Mr. P disagreed with his assessment of a threat? That was alarming. It was clear that man was compromised, likely accepting some bribe or promise of power by Bukharina. The thought made Suslov's blood curl. This wasn't Bukharin's party, it was Suslov's. Suslov prepared for the inevitable. The power play would soon come, he predicted, and he was rarely wrong about these things. When Bukharin attempted to goad him into a trap, she wouldn't even see his coming. The work of a genius or a paranoia of a megalomaniac. We're going crazy here, man, I swear to God. And we aren't even ticking our talk or our clocks. A new associate. Papers detailing every last aspect of the lives and careers of Komi's leading communists laid in neat rows on Mikhail Soslov's desk. Even though he knew every person on this desk, he'd gone to the trouble of paper clipping a photo of each individual to the front of their respective file. As much as he hated to admit it, he had indulged a certain feeling of power to play with the two-dimensional surrogates of his colleagues and subordinates as he wove his plans together. With all of his contacts, personal relationships, and other leverage, he could barely or fairly easily determine who would be the next party leader. He skimmed through the last assemblage, intermittently striking some figures off a list outright as being too ambitious. Others were, in Sosal's estimation, too powerful in their own right. And then, of course, there were those who had certain deviant ideas regarding the party's direction. Naturally, it was a man who met none of the criteria that caught Sosal's eye. A seemingly capable but re relatively unknown party of a Perechnik, who Perechnik, would nonetheless distinguish himself as having an ironclad work ethic and most importantly a reputation as someone who could keep secrets. Esteemed comrade, I would re highly recommend or humbly recommend one Y.V. Andropov. Huh. Return the file. Is the dawn of it sufficient? No, no, no. And I'm sorry this video's gone over longer. I just want to finish this next focus. That's all I want right now. The interlude. Uh, Andropov's Ascension. Afanasy was, by his own admission, a man with no real importance, and he'd never been especially interested in his hometown's turbulent politics. He'd always been a believer that when paramilitaries were brawling in the streets and politi politicians doing the same in the National Assembly, the best course of action is keep one's heads down and pretend, pretend not to notice it, uh, any of it. However, despite his best efforts, it was rather hard to ignore the constant barrage of posters, leaflets, and other paraphernalia of electoral democracy. Despite his best efforts, he'd come to be familiar with the most curious with most of the cast of the characters commonly depicted on such posters, and when the chill winds of early autumn began to avoid sweeping down onto Sikhita from the Arctic Circle, it all became impossible to ignore as every last scrap of paper in the streets was set loose in the air in a blizzard of political propaganda. Thus, he couldn't help but notice one day when all of the red paper swirling through the streets was adorned with the face of a man he'd never met before. Andropov, who the heck is that? But unfortunately, we cannot fo finish this focus right now because, well, I think going over an hour, it might be a bit much. But regardless, it is 1963 and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, Consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we hopefully get through the election and maybe make our army a little stronger. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!